Okay, so yeah, that, that uh, uh, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, we see that that uh, lends toward the divinity, the full divinity of Jesus, and yet in the womb of the Virgin Mary, so the full humanity of Jesus, and uh, because of this spirit uh, conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary, um, the last line there that we've indi- that we've talked about is what. Sin. He's born without sin. What's that mean about everybody else? We are born with sin. sin yeah, with a sin nature. Uh, uh, in a, uh, we have uh, original uh, guilt and original sin. Yeah. So I have a question. Are, is what is being said here that the sin comes from the genetically male part of? I would hesitate from saying genetically. Spiritually, spiritually, just like a, a man or a woman is born again, yeah. they're really a physical person, but it's a spiritual occurrence. Yeah. Um, so is there a spiritual transfer mm-hmm. through the man of um, the sin nature? Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I was asking, because it seemed like you had said, at least to my ears, that the sin passes through the man, and it's not married. Yeah. Like, that's Yeah, but the, the sin nature into a new human being, we gather from, from Jesus in this distinction um, that he was without sin and that, in fact, he didn't, didn't sin and, and was not uh, tainted by sin, is that it must be then that the um, male is the one being responsible in the garden, right? He didn't sin first, but he's blamed for it. Um, that the spiritual responsibility, and this goes into husbands and fathers too, the spiritual responsibility remains on the man. Uh, and, and so with that, you have the um, sin nature being transferred um, by the man being involved in conception, however that is done even with medical technology today. It's not, I guess it's not worth further discussion because it's not what if. Yeah, and you could once once you if you would if you would somehow be able to you know theoretically as we start thinking about it, you know when we get to the second level we find it stupid but but if you could uh, create a human being from two women which you couldn't because you need both male and female components yeah. in the zygote to create a human being and so once you've got the male components it's male. Yeah, I guess that's so it's a, a logical and a um, actual impossibility. Yeah. So I guess since we did kind of broach the subject, I'll ask it. Let's, let's you know conceive of a, a distant future, near distant future, where the components are actually synthesized as opposed to being, you know, based. To me, that's an argument against us never reaching that. That will never happen mm-hmm. because. But let's say, you know, my argument isn't isn't. Yeah, I'm going to cut you off there because I don't want to get into foolishness. <laughs> really, I mean, the, Calvin said that. There are some things you can talk about that just the answers to it uh, bring you into uh, uh, an impossibility that uh, that is inaccurate no matter how, answer, how you answer. Yeah, it's like the, can God make a believer? That, that, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah Allison. Um, with the reasonable soul part, does that... Yeah. Um, bleed into Jesus ability to choose sin if he like really wanted to um you know I don't think they had that in their intent but I wasn't privy to their discussions there are some notes that you know some people have read that are not really available but PhD candidates who are looking into this have, have seen um but I I, I really think uh, what you see here is that the true body and reasonable soul are them saying fully God and fully man. And, and uh, in the fully man part, you've got a real human body and you've got a real human soul. That's no different. So like, like Hebrews, um, um, Hebrews 2, 14 through 16, he's 
you know, created as man as we are yet without sin. Okay, so, I mean, let's, let's go ahead and look at that so you can see. This isn't just people talking theology, but it's people talking theology from the scriptures. So Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> So 2.14. And Teresa, could you read that for us? Uh, Hebrews 2.14. Yeah, so Jesus takes on um, our, our humanity um, there um, so that he can uh, stand in our, our shoes. And let's see, where, where, uh, where is that verse then, 214? I, I just picked up a related verse for us instead of the, the verse on point. Um, like us in all ways, yet without sin. Anyone got that on tip of your tongue? Okay, let's go to Hebrews 10. Four fifteen. There we go. There's four four fourteen through sixteen and 2, 14, and 15 are two go-to verses, and, and I mixed up the, the um, language in there. So look at uh, 14, um, or 4, 15, sorry, getting my numbers bejumbled there. Um, so let's start with 14 and then read 15 as well. Um, Mike, can you read that for us, 14? And then 15. Um, Chris, can you read that for us? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as, just as we are, yet was without sin. I thought you were stopping me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so that's that's Christ there being without sin, not having a sin nature um, there. Um, he is, serves as our high priest. So created in the flesh like we are from uh, 2.14 and then uh, 4.15 here uh, being one um, who is uh, like us and tempted in every way, yet was without sin. Okay. All right, let's go on to go on to our lesson now. Any other questions about that? That's a huge, huge doctrine that we stamped out in the first 400 years of the church. Um, two things, essentially, the, the nature of Jesus and the relationship of the Trinity. Those were the two main issues in the first four centuries of the church. Just for clarity in my own brain, I maybe yeah. there is no answer to this, but would it be... In my thinking, would it be wrong to believe that basically Mary only provided a womb for the conception? And DNA. Oh, you're yeah. saying and DNA? Now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. She was the egg. Okay. Absolutely. True human body. So human God, DNA. God also created Adam. And yeah. he was a true human being. Yeah. And so he did not need. Yeah. You know, I'm just yeah. saying, was it a package? It doesn't seem to doesn't room. seem to be because the um, the scriptures bring such a point. Uh, Jesus cannot sacrifice for us unless he is truly us, and that's the importance of the full de full humanity of Jesus. If he is not a man like us, he is not a substitute, because bulls and goats are not a substitute. They're graciously granted by God through the Old Testament days, but. Um, 
as the writer of Hebrews says, it's not, no, a, a, a bull and a goat is not like us. And, and we need someone like us to represent us in um, dying for sin. And so, so without, without human DNA, and we don't have any indication. Um, and in fact, the early heresy in the church was that Jesus was not fully human. That was the first attack on, it, it wasn't the other way around. And so we see that like in 1 John um, and uh, John itself, but mostly 1 John is that there was this attack on the humanity of Jesus. Um, Hebrews 2 is all about the humanity of Jesus because, and think about Hebrews being about high priest and sacrifice. If Jesus is not fully human, we are lost in our sins. We're dead in our sins because we do not have somebody who's substituted for us in our stead. Yeah. I, it, I it's it's like, up yeah. He doesn't need DNA to create human because that's right. But it's not. And and so the issue is to see, Steve, is it's not divine fiat. It's not like we talked about last week in the sermon. God, in doing his justice, doesn't wave a magic wand and get away and get rid of our sin. He actually does justice on a human being um, uh, who is is standing in our place or hanging in our place. Confused that thinking Mary had to be perfect, otherwise, then you know Jesus couldn't have been perfect if she wasn't perfect. Is that how they? They they can yeah they can. They take her. That's part that's part of it I would imagine. Okay. Um, that they're 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 dealing with that. Um, they've got other things, you know, attached to Mary too, or they just you know want a kind of a, a fantasy view of, you know. She's perfect, as as uh, Lord Farquaad would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Transmuted through the man. Okay. That's correct. So so Mary has a sin nature. Every woman from conception has a sin nature and that's that's transported as from the point of conception but what we understand from what must be really with with the uh, um with jesus is that it comes comes through the man okay, yeah, yeah. And, and that that matches up with adam getting the blame in the garden for something he didn't do okay yeah that puts everything in i mean he agreed with it but he didn't do it yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and it goes it goes into male leadership, which which spills into everything. Yeah. You know, whether it's whether it's husband to wife, father to, to family, um, leadership in the church. Um, but you, you have this that in in the the roles of things we don't we have God the Father, not God the Mother. God the Father is responsible for sovereign decree, and, and so um, just as um, uh, the the guilt or the fault of sin coming into the world is laid on Adam very clearly, Romans 5 especially, but but even in Genesis 3, um, that uh, we understand from this, all the, the spiritual stuff in human families comes comes through the man. And we see it sociologically as well. You know, you've, you guys have probably heard the stat if you've been around a while, at least this was true in the, um, and there'd be no reason for it changing. Um, uh, in the the nineties, stu- early nineties, a study was done and it showed you know if a uh, a mom and dad both go to church and bring their kids, the kid stays in church for it never leaves eighty five percent of the time. Mom and dad faithfully go to church, bring their kids. The kids stay in church, never leave. They don't have a period in college where they go crazy, um, and they're always in the church. Okay, uh, if it's just the father, it goes down to like eighty percent. So from 80 to 85%. If it's just the mother, it goes down to 48%. Daughters and sons. So if a, a, a family grows up, kids grow up in a home where only the mom is bringing the kids to church or both parents are bringing the kids to church but the dad doesn't care, he's just a tag along, um, then you're down at like 48%. 
I get numbers mixed up in my head, but that's basically the, the spread of things. If someone has neither parent um, bringing, bringing them to church, but comes to faith like through in high school through a friend or something like that, it's like 22% it lasts through life uh, with, no, with no breaks. Uh, but you see that, that there's just something about the father saying, hey, no, we're going. <laughs> that communicates to the boys and the girls who are the, the daughters and the sons in, in the marriage. And it's not that, um, it's not that uh, women are less important. It's not that women have less value. It's just that's the way God has structured life. And, uh, and you know, I've seen that in 23 years of, of ministry. Um, and, and that's why we, you know, getting, getting dad's faces about, you know, uh, uh, being here and being the one that's leading. Because if you think it's okay to have your wife take the kids to church and you just stay at home, um, that's not just, we'll talk about this morning, not in uh, family situations, but um, that will affect your kids. Um, and and so, you know, um, yeah. So we've seen it, Betsy and I have seen it plenty in our lives with people that we know. It's like, got a dad who's all in. Um, those kids are pretty solid. Uh, if it's just, if it's just the mom, um, then there's a little bit of a mix. Yeah. Yeah. It has nothing to do with cultural, you know, anything. Yeah. It's just that's the way it is. It's, it's inbuilt. Yeah. It's just, it's the structure of human beings and human life and human society. It's just, it's just what is. Yeah. It takes that whole argument of more value, less value. Correct. Throw it out. Yeah. It says, it's just the way it is. Yeah. And it's a question of, you know, anytime we're dealing with role stuff, we're, we're dealing with, um, and Bill, was, you and I having this kind of discussion this week, um, that uh, uh, it's not a question of value. Um, the women bear the image of God. Men bear the image of God. Um, the, uh, there's no, uh, and, and it's a question of roles. It's a question of not having two heads and four feet. You know, you have one left foot and one right foot. And it's a question of roles. And the left foot doesn't say, but I want to be on the right side. You're more important because you're on the right side. You know, it's, it's, it's not that. It's like you need both feet and their roles and, and you don't want two right feet or three feet. Um, it's like, it would be like arguing when it's more important oxygen or gravity. Oxygen is giving you life. Right. Gravity keeps you on the ground. Yeah. They're both, yeah, have great purpose. They're both essential. Um, it was not good for the man to be alone. And so there are roles uh, in this. And, and, um, and so, yeah, um, so, so that's, uh, that's uh, the issue there. And so there is this, um, yeah, role, role division. And, and you see it in all kinds of things. It, it's, it, it, it flo what it does, it flows from the Trinity. You know, God, God the Father is the one who makes decrees, and Jesus is subservient to the decree. And, and this is the comfort for the wife, for the mother, uh, in, because she's in the role of Jesus. Is that an insult? To say, not my will, but yours be done? No, it's not an insult. It's to Jesus' great credit and, and our admiration of him that he, in the, in the persons of the Trinity, is in this subservient role, as is the Holy Spirit. We, in the Trinity, you don't have three persons arguing over what they're going to do. Um, now, in marriage, this doesn't mean that, that um, the husband doesn't listen to the wife. He's an idiot if he doesn't listen to his wife. Just like, and, and, Paul, and Paul talks about in Scripture, that the husband, the husband is the head in the relationship and the head in a body 
listens to its body. Okay, so when the, when the hand goes on the stove and the stove is hot, the hand says, you better give a command to pull me off the, the stove. And, and the head says, ooh, I get that signal. Get off there, right, if it's not too hot, right? You know, let's just say it's warm and it's, if I keep my hand on here, it's going to burn. Okay, so we'll keep it out of the central nervous system, in other words, and, and make it a conscious decision. Um, so a, a wise husband listens to his wife, a wise dad listens to his kids, but then the husband decides. He has the final word, and the final word better be to the best of his wife and his kids. And it better be sacrificial, because then Jesus becomes head of the church, and he's sacrificial for the sake of the church. He listens to the needs, he sees the needs of the church, and he serves the church even though he's its head and king. Right? So a lot of times the complaint comes against male headship, and it's against obnoxious, terrible, violent male headship. And we're saying that's not what scripture is talking about. Scripture is talking about male headship where the husband loves the wife and nourishes and cherishes her like he does his own body. For what man ever hated his own wife uh, is what Paul says in, in uh, Ephesians 5, but doesn't nourish and cherish his wife like he does his own body. You know, so if you're the head and your stomach is cramping up from hunger, you're starting to get a headache like I do because you haven't eaten enough, you listen to your body because you like your body <laughs> and you feed your body um, and, and you don't do things to, to harm your body unless you've got um, psychological issues. Does that make sense? Um, really Liar. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, hand, the example you gave of the hand is really kind of Thank you. Right. And if the brain say, says no, there is immense damage to the rest of the body that will subsequently affect everything. Yeah, it's a very stupid decision of the head not to take care of his body. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's the case with husbands. It's the case with dads. It's a case with elders in a church. Yeah. And the nervous system did its job. Yeah. Because of the brain's decision, though. Yeah. The entire thing is affected. Yeah. And so that's like those, uh, there's, you know, there's certain neurological disorders where the nervous system doesn't function properly. Yeah. It doesn't send that danger. Yeah. You know, and then so the brain is making terrible decisions. Because it doesn't have the right information. Exactly. From the body, and yeah. The reverse, where neurology, neurology is sending this, the same when the brain ignores it. And yeah. Not... Yeah. Good. Excellent. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're gonna hit. I'm gonna hit for us a bunch of stuff. In fact, I'm just gonna. Can you read that? Okay. So that's the size of that, all right. I'll make it a little bit bigger here. Whoop, there we go. So this is some stuff we've seen. Uh, read Acts 2.17, Bob. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Okay, so uh, that's whom? Who says this? Peter. Peter, and when is this? Pentecost. Okay, and what's he... What's he describing when he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people? Is that something in his future? No. What's he describing? Events. Right then, what's happening before his eyes. Yeah, that, there we go. Tongues of fire on people's head, indicating, you know, like Old, Old Testament, the Holy Spirit present with his people through the pillar of fire at night and the, the pillar of cloud. And, and so Peter's saying, what you see here now at Pentecost is example that we are in the what? Last days. Okay, uh, Hebrews 1 1, David, can you read this for us? And 1 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he's, he has spoken to us by his son, 
Okay, so what does the writer of Hebrews say about the last days? These. Yeah, it's it's our days, these last days, and he gives one one event that's happened to us that's that's true of being in the last days. And what's that event he mentions here? Jesus, Jesus speaking. Jesus is here. No longer is are we just reliant on prophets and seeing dreams and visions and that kind of thing, but God directly has been here and he has spoken to us. God has spoken to us in his son Jesus. And because of this, we know that we are in these last days. So the writer of Hebrews as well says in the first century, so we're at about A.D. 66, Peter was at about A.D. 30. They're both saying we're in the last days because of these uh, things. Jesus speaking to us, tongues of fire, and people speaking in various languages at, at Pentecost so people could understand in their, their native language. Okay. Um, Next, James, James 3, Joyce. You have well in the last day. Okay, anyone remember when James was written? 64. Close. Uh, the right second digit. 44. 44, yeah. 44, 45, James is writing. So, you know, split the difference between Hebrews and Peter. They're all saying in the first century, here's another person saying, and James is saying to his audience in Antioch or wherever he's writing to, he's saying, you've done what? Hoarded, Hoarded wealth in the last days. And he's talking to those people. And those people are in what days? The last, the last days. days, yeah. Um, so we're dealing with the last days. Then Second Peter 3.3. 3. Um, Harrison, can you read this for us? Okay, good. So people were scoffing at the Christians in uh, Peter's day in the churches in Turkey to whom he was writing. And they were scoffing and saying, where is this coming that Jesus promised? Ha, huh, it hasn't happened. And we're already in A.D. 66 or 67. Where, and this is just, you know, like everything is as it always has been. Jesus isn't coming. They were scoffing at the idea. And Peter's reply is, you must understand that when? In the, last days. in the last days, scoffers will come. This is ordinary stuff that scoffers come um, in the last days and they're following their own evil desires, which was the other problem going in, in these going on in these churches that Peter addresses in Second Peter. Yeah, Crystal. That is so true now in 2022. Yeah. So, um, that's exactly what's happening right now. Yeah, yeah. Which brings us into, I think we're to it now, there we go. Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, so what we what we see here is um, when we're talking about the last days, we're talking about stuff that ebbs and flows throughout history and depending on which, which country you're in. So if you were in um, the promised land or Italy or Turkey during the first century, uh, most of those years, you're experiencing persecution as a Christian and scoffers as a Christian. The, the New Testament is full of helping Christians get through the persecution they were enduring. Okay? Now, if you're in the United States in the 1950s, you're probably being persecuted because you're not in church on Sunday morning. But if you're around today in the United States, different time, ebb and flow, up and down, um, you tell someone, yeah, you go to church every week, and they say, what? Huh. Yeah, huh? Really? <laughs> really? Why do you do that? I hate the church. It says this and that, you know, and they give you some story, right? And so ebb and flow, even in our own country, up and down. So, you know, 1920s, throwing out of moral restraints, and then you got the Great Depression and World War II, and lo and behold, the world says, uh, I think I'll give God, or the United States says, I think I'll give God a try. <laughs> so we wind up with a very church-going 1950s, and then those who are born after these troubles of the, the Great Depression and World War II 
grow up and say, why all these rules and why go into church? Why don't we just live like we want to? You know, drug, sex, and rock and roll. And so you got, you got the mid to you know, late 60s through early 70s where all those restraints are, are thrown off. So there's you know, ebb and flow. And then Reagan comes in because people in my generation come up and say, we don't like how things are chaotic. And unlike the people 10, 15 years ahead of us who didn't know that drugs generally makes you dead, <laughs> right? They didn't know that. You know, like James Taylor said, all my friends were dying and I didn't know why I hadn't died as well because, you know, he was in and out of drug rehab as well, as well as some depression um, inpatient facilities. Um, and, and, but, but now we know, you know, so rock bands now, they're not drug infested because they know the damage it does and that they can't perform and remain creative through, you know, through drug use. Um, and and so, whereas, you know, like in the jazz community in the 50s and 60s and the, the rock community in the 60s and 70s, you know, that was just through and through, you know, uh, drug, drug culture. And so that, you know, and, and now we're, we're back to, you know, the, the, we're in this, this ebb or flow or nadir, you know, not an apex of morality and turning toward God, that kind of thing. Um, if you're in Nigeria now, your, your home is in danger of being burnt down by militant Muslims. If you're a Christian, you're in danger of being shot. If you're a Christian, if you're in an uh, Islamic state, um, you're in danger of being imprisoned and, and killed um, today. And so every day, Christians are being killed in different countries in the world. Um, and so these things are going on. But look at this list of stuff, and we'll get to these things later. Uh, but look at this list of stuff on the right. Uh, Jim, can you read this uh, for us? Gospel proclamation, tribulation, apostasy, antichrist, wars, earthquakes, famines. Okay, now before we, I say anything else, do have famines? Are there famines today, and have there been famines since the time of Jesus? Yes. 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 How about earthquakes? Yes. yes. How about wars? Yes. How about antichrist? Now consider this with First John. If you're real familiar with First John, what does John say? Antichrist is already among us, okay? And so this is spirit against Jesus. So that's something. And again, 1950s United States versus now. You know, there's a big spirit of Antichrist now versus the 1950s. Um, what about apostasy, a, a going away from biblical doctrine? Yeah, you know, throughout the history of the church. How, what about tribulation or troubles? Yeah, we have those and gospel proclamation. Yeah, this is not something particular to one age or where one age all of a sudden has all these things and previous times haven't had it. Um, there are these things going on during the apostles' time and in the second century, in the third, in the fourth, in the fifth. And it's just an ebbing and flowing. And, and we'll, we'll look at this more later when we look at uh, Matthew 24, maybe next week, um, that, that um, uh, you've got um, Jesus saying, these things are things that are going to be in play for you. And when you see these things, just know, yep, we're in the last days. Just like Peter's going to say, just like James is going to say, just like the writer of Hebrews is going to say, just like Peter is going to say in Second Peter, we're in the last days, and in the last days you're going to have these things. Or just like in the book of Revelation, you're going to have all this chaos of the, the, uh, six, the six uh, um, seals in, in uh, Revelation 6. Earthquakes and wars and death and pestilence. And, and, but don't think that that means all of a sudden I'm going to come back. Because this stuff is just going to be the norm for the era in, in between my advents, from advent to advent. Steve, you had a question. Yeah. Well, so there is a last to the last. In other words, there's ebb and flow now, and we mm -hmm. are in the last days, but there will be a last day. And so there, there will be a last day at the last, hard. at the last day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But it's just hard to acclimate ourselves when yeah. we're in the tribulation to yeah. think that it's not the last day. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. the dispensationalists have made a fortune out of this is the last day. It's, it's about to happen. We're in the last days. We weren't before, and now we are. And 
you know, at, at, I remember when I was in uh, seminary and our, our pastor at the church, he was preaching through Revelation, and he alerted us to the fact that every generation since the printing press has printed material that says, we are in the last days now. We weren't before because they look at different things and they say, ah, oh, this wasn't this way when I was a kid, and now it's this way. So we're you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, so you can watch Jack Van Empey if he's still alive. And, you know, he pulls out his newspaper or whatever he pulls out these days and, and says, see, uh, Rexella, we're in the last days. She says, we sure are, Jack. Um, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, Allison. Um, with some of this stuff, um, it, is there significance to the fact that it has happened before the first coming? Like famines, is yeah. they're mentioned in like so, Genesis and right. uh, like Ruth. There's a great earthquake during the days of um, uh, um, oh, the king in the mid 700s with uh, or mid uh, 600s. Uzziah, I want to say Uzziah. Uzziah. Yeah, and there's a huge earthquake during his day, you know, in Israel. But yeah. All these things. And so this is Jesus saying when he's talking about this stuff is things will go on as they have, even though, and this is the point of Revelation, even though Jesus is on his throne, and let me show you here, John, Jesus is on his throne. Even though he's on his throne, you will have wars and death and famine and persecution and earthquakes and all kinds of stuff. Just because Jesus is on the throne doesn't mean the earth is cleaned up. That won't happen until Jesus comes again, till the, the seventh seal or the, the seventh trumpet, and the earth and the earth declares like we will, I think, in our call to worship this morning, you know, hallelujah, for the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign on earth forever and ever. That's the, that's the seventh trumpet. That's the coming of Jesus. When Jesus rules fully, um, fully dominant, and not in coercion toward his own people because he's removed our sin nature. We voluntarily are walking in his ways, and he's reigning on earth, God dwelling with his people in the new heavens and new earth, as he speaks of in Revelation 21. But until then, the book of Revelation is about all the chaos, the troubles, like Jesus said in John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Same word as revelation. You will have troubles, tribulation, same word. Um, but take courage, I've overcome the world. You may die, but I've got you. I'll, I'll bring you home. So Paul says, hope I do die in this prison, because then I get to be with Jesus, Philippians 1. Um, or he may save me from this physical threat of death. Um, you know, you may die of cancer, or heart attack, or get run over by a truck, but that doesn't mean Jesus is on his throne taking care of you. It's just Jesus, you know, Jesus in your death is taking care of you, bringing you to himself. Um, but you won't get run over by a truck or die from cancer in the new heavens and new earth when Jesus comes. Um, seventh trumpet, seventh uh, seal, etc., um, and uh, blesses us not only spiritually, like today, but also physically, also. Okay. So good, you guys are getting this. Um, so now, um, signs of the times, primarily. Um, Matthew, would you read that? You haven't talked enough. I want to hear your voice. Go ahead. <laughs> Read the title of this, these three lines. Uh, yeah. Signs of the times, primarily present realities throughout our era. Okay, so that list you saw on the, on the right-hand side of that page, coming from uh, uh, various places, but uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13 are places we see that kind of thing. But these are primarily uh, present realities. These signs are things going on now and that have gone on from the times of the apostles. Um, so, uh, Steve, can you read this first bullet? As we've examined the New Testament speakers and writers named the time of the first century 
to be the last days. Okay, so we looked at like what, five places, something like that, where they're all calling the first century the last days because of the things going on in the first centuries, in the first century. Um, Chris, would you read this for us? Peter points to signs at Pentecost, for instance, to prove they, in the first century, were in the last days, Acts 2, 17. Okay, so Acts 2, 17, you got the flames of, the, the tongues of fire, and people were speaking in, in these languages of all these people that had come from all these other countries, and Peter says, okay, that's the last day. So the signs point to the fact that the church, prior to Jesus coming back, after his coming, or even you could include during his coming, is in the last days. Uh, and Bill, third bullet. So do we need to look for signs today that point to our being in the last days? No. We can just understand that the stuff that we see is like, yep, this Jesus said this stuff would be around in the last days. We shouldn't expect that um, my field won't have weeds in it. Um, I shouldn't be surprised if uh, we uh, have f flooding rains in the spring and I can't plant my crops until a month too late, which happens. It happened like in Ohio a couple of years ago, you know, so everything was behind and, you know, and it happened to Christian farmers too. Um, so things happen um, like this and we don't have to on the one hand say, oh, we're in the last days. And on the other hand, we don't have to look for those things to see if we are in the last days. We just understand, yep, the world will go on with weeds and thorns and, and strife and wars and earthquakes until Jesus comes and fixes this. Yes, so Steve. So we live comfortably in the reality that we live in an ebb and flow. Yeah. And if Jesus returns, instead of being shocked, we go, duh. I mean, right. that's really what it yeah. is. It's like... Right. Okay. So yep. that's that's easier for me than oh, I think I think the Pope is an antichrist. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And so um <laughs> so our question there, Dakota. Do we need to look for signs today that we are in the last days? And Michael Scott says no. No, no, that's right. Um so let's just look at uh one of these things. So um Teresa, can you read this question? Yeah. <laughs> a school crossing, yeah. No. No, they're not there to help us predict the time of the second coming. They're there as a just a background reassurance. Yep, still in the last days because these things are going on. It's, it's almost more of a, we're not in the new heavens and new earth yet. It's, almost, it's more of a sign of that, isn't it? that we're not in the new heavens and new earth yet when we see these things. It's a reminder, yep, I'm in this era where things are chaotic and where people are in rebellion against Jesus. Um, and they shouldn't be, but they are and they will be until Jesus comes again and casts out those who have refused to bow their knee to him and uh, only keep on the earth those who have. Okay. Sign, sign, sign. <laughs> sign, sign, yeah, that's right. Um, and then, um, Christina, can you read this second bullet? What did Jesus constantly say about how we are to posture ourselves regarding his return and its timing? Be ready and watching. Be ready and watching. And so that's what we'll look at next week when we get together. We'll look at um, a one place where Jesus gives boom. He's talking about when he'll come back, and he gives these four illustrations of how we won't know and we're just always to be ready um and so that's um yeah he says always be ready so there we go um just always be ready um that's what jesus said keep watch be ready for you know not when the son of man comes again when he returns okay so to look at things in society and in the world as a sign that he's coming Jesus, it's just going against what Jesus said you won't know there won't be indication that okay Jesus is about to come you won't know 
All you have are these signs that, that you're not in the new heavens and new earth yet. But to find, keep watch. Keep watch. Know that Jesus could come in two seconds from now. But and I mean, what do we, yeah. if we're watching, we're, lo we're looking. Yeah. So keep watch. We'll see it in one of the parables, and I'll just spill the beans here. Do what your master required you to do so that when he comes, he finds you doing it. That's keeping watch. Gotcha. Without um, anxiety. Without anxiety. Yeah, because you're walking in his ways. You're not beating his servants that he puts you in charge of. And when he comes, you're like, excellent. <laughs> you're not scared. You're not like, nothing, right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. We had one of our daughters did that once. There's a good King of the Hill where Bobby is practicing his kissing on, a, on his, uh, his uh, uh, cousin. Is Luann his cousin? Yeah, Luann. Luann. His cousin is in beauty school, and so she's got a mannequin head that she practices her dyeing the hair and that kind of thing. And Bobby's practicing his kissing on the mannequin <laughs> a doll head. And he's all at home alone and he doesn't realize because he's so engrossed in it that his parents have come home and they come home and they see him and he looks up and, and they say, hi, Bobby. And he says, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to be like that. We just see Jesus come and we say, great, finally, excellent. Um, and that's that's keeping watch. It's, it's, it's always living like he could come in the next second and I'm ready. I'm ready for him to come. Okay, so. Yeah, and that's part of it too. It says keep watching yourself so that, so that when he comes, there's not going to be a sign to see. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll see in um, one of the, the parables that he releases there that there's an aspect of expectation, but there's no sign. It's just, I'll be back at any time. Or it's like when the cable guy says, we'll be there sometime between one and five. <laughs> right? So you're keeping watch, but there's no sign two minutes before he comes because he, he hasn't told you, I will call when I'm on my way. Okay? And Jesus is saying, I won't call when I'm on my way. I'll be there between one and five, which could be 10,000 years or in the first century. And so that's why the you know, apostles speak I was, I'm in First Thessalonians right now. You know, all the all the Christians in the first century were doing were were waiting for Jesus to appear. Back then, but they weren't saying he's guaranteed to appear in our lifetime, but they were watching and waiting. They knew he could appear at any instant. Um, nothing else needs to happen. Um, it's just okay. Let's pray.